last time we covered burp uh it was with the free community edition which only has all the manual tooling but today we're gonna bust out the big guns and we're gonna kind of deep dive a little bit more into the automated tooling that exists that really is gonna make you know it's gonna be able to step your game up significantly with burp suite and really get to finding that um low hanging fruit out there so with that being said let's go ahead and move on to our first slide so uh, Rob kind of covered uh, the who am I uh, there. Uh, I did get my start in CTF events and like boot to root style exercises in my early teens. I think I was about 14 when I started doing it. Uh, moved on to other platforms like Hack the Box, where I usually maintain a hacker rating or higher usually. Uh, I got my OSCP in 2018 and got a job doing pen testing early this year. And uh, we work with a wide range of clients, small to medium sized businesses to the Fortune 500. No clients too big or too large and um, or too big or too small. <laughs> and uh, we exclusively provide boutique penetration testing services on pretty much all fronts that you could ever need. So um, our agenda today is to how to burp good. So we're going to demonstrate the raw power and capability within our time constraint. Um, now, the caveat is, of course, that the number of features and capability available within this tool is extremely vast. Uh, there's no way I can cover all of it in an hour or whatever time frame you could spend weeks, right? I'm going to give you guys um, kind of a rundown, though, of what I think the, the heavy hitting tools are from there. And uh, we're going to basically get right into it. And uh, we're going to cover some of the differences. Again, uh, the Burp Application Store and um, why that's so important in the pro edition. Uh, the active scan and passive modules, which make your life a lot easier and some things that you should avoid while using them. Uh, we're gonna cover session management as well, um, kind of how web app sessions work, just a quick rundown, um, and how we basically automatically handle those sessions within Burp Suite. Uh, matches, match, match, and Burp Collaborator for out of test testing. Hey, Logan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, man, but you're breaking up really badly. I'm breaking up really badly. Yeah, unfortunately. The sound, I, I don't know if other people are feeling that too, but it feels like that uh, sounds like you're breaking up there. Yeah, I yeah, thought it was yeah. just me at first. Okay, give me just a second. Is that any better? No, I think it's I think it's actually your connection. Uh, I'm on the Ethernet here, and it's Google Fiber. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me try. Is my audio still coming in bad? Now, now it's better. Now it it's sounds better. good now. Yep. Sounds good now. Yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's so go back. So let's go, let's go back, and we'll just we'll just roll on. So sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no worries. If yeah, the audio quality is bad, I definitely want to know. Um, so I don't know if how much of that you guys just heard. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so basically, I already kind of gave you guys a rundown on myself. Um, some of the things we're going to cover today are Burp Application Store and why it's so important in the Pro version, um, Active Scan and Passive Modules, how to scan with precision, debugging scan jobs, and things you shouldn't do with the active scan and, this, um, and why you should just never use the spider tool. Uh, session handling and how Burp can handle that for you automatically. Uh, we're gonna go into proxy rules, match and replace magic, and Burp collaborator for out of band testing. Um, so, still coming through good? Yep, can you go back to presentation mode, please? Yes, yes. I can. All right, so. Burp Pro versus Burp Community Edition. So number one is gonna be the cost, obviously. Um, Burp Professional Edition is not free. It's $400 a year. If you're a penetration tester, it might be a non-issue for you or your company likely pays for it. Um, I would highly recommend mastering the free edition before you take the leap into the Pro Edition. Passive analysis modules. Probably the most significant thing you will notice with Burp Pro is that it passively inspects the websites as you follow through them in your browser. And as you do that, it adds issues into a tracker basically for each host. It's extremely powerful and can include anything from automatically detecting like web application errors, 
email addresses, vulnerable JavaScript library, libraries, software versions, missing HTTP security headers, and a lot more. I'd never be able to list all of it out. Passive analysis can also be extended with extender plugins, which we're going to see as well. Um, Active scan. This is what most people would consider the, the big guns of Burp Suite. This allows you to basically perform precision automated scanning for hundreds of different vulnerabilities on specific parameters and pages of your choosing in any place in any way that you desire. So this can also be supercharged as well with, again, Burp Suite, uh, Burp App Store extensions uh, to add varying levels of methodology checks or for additional customized issues, you can create your own as well. Um, an active scan of every dynamic parameter should be a bare minimum of any quality application penetration test. Um, and it's not just these three things that it is. Uh, there's going to be, you know, a lot of things that you will find are different, but these are probably the biggest things. Burp Free, again, contains mostly all the manual tooling and the power of the automated tooling can bring a lot more to the table and it's definitely worth its weight in gold. And if you want, you can also check out that link below. It's on Portswigger's website. So we're going to cover up or cover some tools that I would consider almost necessary. And uh, I'm going to switch back and forth from the PowerPoint here because I can't share multiple screens, but I'm going to pull up my burp window. Um, you can use uh, pretty much anything that you can write yourself. You can make your own Python or Java extensions. Uh, we're going to stray, stray away from covering the custom extensions too much and stick to what's approved and on the Burp Store at the current moment. Um, all the plugins and extensions are available for free. Um, so I'd like to take a second and show you what I think are some must-haves here. So in pulling this up here, um, I'm going to go ahead and head over to my extender tab here, and I'm going to kind of show you guys what I use at work uh, when I do application penetration testing and what I think are some essentially necessary modules. So additional scanner checks is one of them uh, that just, as the name implies, adds additional content and checks to the scanner when you invoke it. Um, Active scan plus plus is another um, active module that also adds additional checks to your scans. Retire.js automatically adds and detects passively as you browse through sites. It can detect out-of-date JavaScript libraries that may have known CVEs or vulnerabilities. So you can also use that to quickly dig up, you know, any sort of weak JavaScript libraries. Uh, software version reporter automatically uses regular expressions to inspect responses and detect software versions that are returned in web responses. Uh, Logger++ plus plus imperative for being able to debug any of your automated um, scanning tools. Uh, J2EE scan is like a, like a Java-based Vuln scanner. It's focused towards like uh, Tomcat and uh, other Java web apps. And um, essentially it adds a whole array of uh, the, that web server specific checks, finds a lot of useful stuff I've found. Uh, software vulnerability scanner is another one. Uh, Java deserialization scanner and Ready are Java deserialization scanners that add additional Java uh, deserialization payloads that can help you get code execution in a lot of the cases. Uh, SAML Raider uh, can basically what it can do is for websites that use SAML authentication, it can strip the responses and basically self-sign the responses and on weak SAML implementations, you can oftentimes impersonate other users by just modifying this response um, with SAML Raider. So that's a really good tool to have in the bag. Um, Autorize basically can check for authentication related issues by replaying each request that you have from an unauthenticated and authenticated standpoint. And you can also give it other user session cookies so you can check that user A can't access user B's stuff and so on and so forth without having to do that manually. A um, couple other things here that are specific to certain technologies uh, that I won't go into too much. For example, Telerik, um, specifically looks for versions of .NET Telerik UI that are vulnerable. Uh, we've been running into a code execution issue that 
came out at the end of last year that um, we found this extension is really good for detecting. And um, upload scanner is also kind of self-explanatory. Um, it scans file upload forms and looks for ways it can bypass file uploads. Like, so let's say it's a, a Facebook image upload and it will scan in every which way possible to see what types of file extensions it can upload and use all sorts of basically, you know, trickery on file uploads to attempt to trick the file upload into allowing files that it shouldn't, which can result in code execution or a number of other bad things. So uh, what we're going to go ahead and do now after taking a look at some of those is we're going to go ahead and hop into the actual demonstration of the active scan and the passive modules here. And what I'm going to use to demonstrate that is an application called Damn Vulnerable Web Application, or DVWA, and a site called vulnerable-website.com that's ran by Portswigger. Now, what you're going to notice is, and I've already configured my browser to run with Burp, and uh, I covered all the setup um, in our first presentation with Burp, so I'm not going to get back into that. But essentially, Burp, you know, is a web proxy that allows you to inspect and modify the traffic that comes to the browser. And you can see here that when I browse to this site and without even submitting anything, I've got a list of issues that are populated here on the right side. And this is all generated from the passive module in Burp Suite. And it can tell you, for example, that since this site's running over clear text HTTP, that this is submitting a password in clear text, which is vulnerable to interception. It's also found four different instances of vulnerable software and how it knows that. And you can verify this by going into the actual quest individually. And it'll tell you that, for example, this site's running mod Perl 2.04. And the reason it knows this, and you can click this arrow down here at the bottom to highlight, it'll highlight how it knows that and it looks like it's being returned in this server header here, which is also returning a number of other software versions, including PHP, Apache, Mod SSL, et cetera. And uh, you can see where it gives you the list of CVEs for each uh, particular vulnerability that it found, and you can automatically click on these links and it'll take you right to them. So you can attempt to exploit those issues. Um, so that's very tremendously helpful when you're auditing a web application for security issues and you're able to quickly just pinpoint, you know, what software is in use, what's out of date, what's actionable, what can be ignored, et cetera. Um, for example, another thing is it uses the get method to submit a password. I think this is a false positive. And the reason why I think this is because the request right here doesn't actually have the password being submitted. I think it thinks this because of the form down here, but this isn't actually the case. So one thing you have to do sometimes is that when it is passively analyzing websites, you'll find oftentimes that sometimes Burp doesn't 100% of the time get it right. So being able to go back into each individual instance that it finds to see that this is actionable or not or really an issue can be a, you know, a big deal. Um, this is kind of like a duplicate of that one, more software version numbers. It kind of gives me output right here and can tell me everything that it detected. Got a couple of missing security headers. Um, it detected an email in one of these responses. Um, a private IP address, which it is because it's running on a virtual machine. And a couple other things. So. This is some of the power of the passive modules, where as you're browsing and clicking through the site, it doesn't actually require that you do anything. It's just finding this automatically as you browse, which is really nice to have. And it covers a lot of that low hanging fruit for you. And of course, again, you can find more extensions on the application store that basically extend upon this. And a lot of the ones that are labeled pro extension involve the active scanning or the passive modules. So again, very, very helpful. And you can also 
break down and see which specific parts it found. If you're dealing with a large number of hosts, say you're on an external penetration test or an internal penetration test where you may have 100 plus hosts, you can go into the issue activity and quickly sort the severity. So you can, you know, only pick out the highs, the mediums, etc. From each host and go back and try to exploit those first. So really useful to have and quite invaluable. Now, the fun part is the active scan module. And active scan also includes something called basically the spider. And when you're crawling a site, basically, there's a couple things that are going to happen when you go to crawl it. For example, a lot of websites have contact forms. Okay. So usually, if you're on a penetration test, or you're auditing security, unless you have a specific reason to do so, you typically want to avoid spamming things like contact forms or feedback forms, et cetera, because it's just going to clog up someone's inbox. The likelihood that you're going to exploit something is rather low, and if you do, it's going to be completely blind to you in the sense that you're not going to be able to see the output of any exploit that you managed to successfully perform. There are ca cases, of course, where that's, you know, different. And, but at the end of the day, that's kind of how that can be. Now, what we're gonna go ahead and do though, is basically, I guess I could demonstrate where there is a way to make it avoid scanning things like that. Because what the spider is going to do is it's just going to basically follow every single link in the application. And as it's doing that, it's going to look for the ones that have dynamic parameters, such as if we sort the responses here. You can see where it's got a checkbox that says params right here. And you can see that on these uh, particular uh, requests, it has, for example, username parameter, password parameter, login. This one's got ID, um, et cetera. So it's going to actually just automatically send all this stuff to the spider and the scanner. You don't want to do that. It's just messy. And it's basically the laziest way you can possibly do it. What you want to do is you want to manually browse through the site and submit uh, data into every form. And that way you've got, um, you know, a various you know, multitude of requests populated. Hopefully you have all of them populated at some point. And once you do that, we can go through that. And you can see where each of the individual respective requests have populated in here. Now, let's just say I want to go ahead and start scanning. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click anywhere in this request body and I'm gonna go ahead and send this over to Intruder. And what that's gonna do is Intruder is gonna have insertion points, basically. Now, most likely I'm only gonna to wanna to scan the IP and the submit parameter. If I scan the cookie parameter, it's gonna log me out and the security low I know isn't vulnerable. But, and I would probably scan this if I didn't know what it was, this particular parameter, but we're not for the purpose of this exercise, right? So, I'm going to right click and I can scan defined insertion points and then we can get into our scan configuration and you notice crawl and audit is blanked out because I'm not crawling. I'm only trying to scan. So we can do a scan configuration. I've got some that I've already manually put together and there's a bunch that come with it. But for the purpose of this, we're going to go ahead and just make a new one. Um, audit speed and audit accuracy. Uh, audit speed is really going to depend on limits of the website itself. Like a lot of times you'll run into like bad applications or, you know, just legacy apps that can't handle uh, a large number of requests really quickly. Uh, not to mention as well, like the audit speed may um, skip certain checks depending on how, uh, which setting you put it on. And then the audit accuracy is kind of um, speaks for itself. You have it on normal, minimize false positives, minimize false negatives. I leave it on normal. Um, issues reported is probably the most important tab 
in this right here, you can see it's got pretty much every single web app vuln it can check for that you could probably think of, um, other than like manual logic ones that require someone like a human looking at it to determine, you know, like a workflow related abuse or something. But yeah, this can check for anything from, you know, SQL injection, backup file existence, um, weird weird things that are informational that might warrant further testing and information or inspection rather. Um, everything that you could really think of. And what I like to do is if possible, um, I like to just leave all of these on. And I'm sure there's some people that, you know, may go back and uncheck uh, some of these that if they know they're not dealing with, for example, if they know they're not dealing with an ASP.NET application. They may uncheck that to speed their scan up, but um, at the end of the day, uh, it's typically not going to be that big of a deal if you uh, just leave all this on, unless it's a really sensitive or fragile application that can crash if you send it bogus data. So from here, it's handling application errors. I like to just put this on the highest it'll go, um, basically. Because I'm usually manually debugging it. We're going to look at that in just a second as well as soon as I fire this off. Leave all this the same. You can ignore certain insertion points right here. Um, and it's got a bunch of pre-made ones. Like, for example, things that are like cookies, um, parameters that are for like known to specific web technologies that don't have vulnerabilities. You can prevent that from scanning it. And some of these defaults are pretty good. I uh, typically leave them as they are. Frequently as occurring assertion points, uh, that just essentially, if it sees the same parameter occurring more than once, it's only going to scan the one instance of it rather than scanning each individual instance because it's likely the same exact function that's handling it. I usually change the insertion points, the maximum to 9999 because the default's 30. And this can bite you if you don't do it because I've ran into applications, typically older ones, that have upwards of two or 300 parameters in the request. They're just absolutely monstrous. Um, so having that set to a high number is typically good right off the bat. And we'll just call this rise config and save that to the library. So we can select our rise config here. And you can leave it on the default resource pool. This is basically the number of threads that it can use. Um, 10 concurrent requests I find is usually good for a, you know, a solid performing web application. You will run into times if you do this a lot where, again, you could get an unstable application that can't handle requests that quickly. So you may have to throttle it down and reduce the maximum number of requests and add like a, a delay between each one as it's sent. But uh, since we're using a VM here that I control, I'm not worried about any performance issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to fire that off. And what that's going to do here is it's going to immediately start populating requests into the scanner. And you can see where the scanner has already sent a significant number of requests. And as it's doing this, let's see why this one isn't uh, isn't working here. So let's make sure that our site's still responsive. Which it looks like it may not be. Double check our Linux box here, make sure we're not uh, crashed for some reason. Seems to be stuck on this. Okay. I believe I see what happened here. So this is this has a command injection vulnerability in it. And what this did was this submitted a ping request. If I go and decode this, and this is something that's important about using logger plus plus to 
monitor your scan jobs is that you're going to see stuff in here that may start going wrong, like your session may get logged out, and we're going to cover how to handle that. But essentially, this is going to be how you debug this. So what happened here, though, is if I decode this, this sent a ping request to for 21 times, basically, uh, to localhost, and the web server hung while it was pinging the box. and because it hung, it wouldn't respond. So that's pretty much what happened there. Now, all these scanner jobs are running running quite well. Um, I noticed extender right here appears to be running fine as well. It's got the session ID in it, so that's good. Um, as this goes on, you'll see where our scanner, though, has found several different issues. It's now got cross-site request forgery, a code injection vulnerability, external service interaction, and an OS command injection. So after running that scan job, all this stuff populates in here, and it immediately shows you the specific request and response and why it thinks it's vulnerable. So the fact that, for example, it injected a sleep command for it to sleep for 10 seconds resulted in a response time of a little over 11 seconds versus a sleep command for zero seconds, which took less than a second to respond, it knows that it's vulnerable. Uh, looks like J2EE scan as well um, checked for something and it found this server status request, and we can actually just request this in the browser by right click, request in browser, copy the link it sent, and looks like it found some sort of debug page for Apache right here. Obviously, you don't want something like this exposed on a web application. So you can see how instead of me having to manually go through, and check a specific parameter here. It can just do all those checks for me and while I dig into the more manual stuff. And you'll see that it sent 1,522 requests, zero errors, and found three different high severity issues. And you kind of have a feed going on here as well. It shows you that. So that's pretty much how the active scan works. We can go ahead and send a couple other requests over as well, like the SQL injection one. And a lot of times when I'm doing this, I just turn the intercept on, fire it off, have the request right here, send to intruder, come over to here, take the junk I don't need out, and right click on this and just go ahead and add that to my scan task. And then it'll pick up right back where I left off uh, with the same configuration and Im immediately begin scanning another parameter. So we're going to scan this ID parameter versus the IP one from this other page. So immediately, you know, we can go back here and start looking at, uh, you know, well, some of the requests it's making. You can see where it's trying to inject sleep commands to the server, and it looks like one has succeeded because the site is hanging and it looks like it wanted it to hang for 20 seconds. So as soon as that comes back, I'm going to go ahead and assume that this is going to fire off an alert for a SQL injection vulnerability because it knows that it was able to make it sleep for 20 seconds. And just because this is a login form right here or a user ID form isn't doesn't limit it to the type of you know SQL commands that you can inject into it, so to speak. Um, so it's going to run through its series of checks, and like I said, as soon as this unhangs for us, it's going to go ahead and should throw an alert. I'm going to guess, and you can see the site is. Let's see, yep, and there it is. So. You can see where it put the sleep commands in, and, ex and it, it actually explains for each individual request in the actual correct context of it. 
Um, it can tell you what the database is, and it can show you the requests and the responses. Well, <laughs> in this case, this generates a, a huge SQL error, so that's a smoking gun, right? Just right off the bat. Uh, this generates no error, and this particular request takes 20 seconds to respond. We can just right click, send that to repeater if we want to verify it, hit send, and we should see that this takes about 20 seconds to come back. And so that way we don't even need to actually manually figure out the syntax or anything like that. We can just take a request with known good syntax and immediately start adding on to it to make it do, you know, additional things. So you can see after I submitted that, it took 20,005 milliseconds. So I don't think that's a coincidence. And I think we've pretty much verified that that's a SQL injection vulnerability. So, um, yeah, that's some of the power of the active scan module. This isn't limited to um, just anything. For example, this vulnerable website page here has a server side request forgery issue in it. We can go ahead, it can test for that as well. We can send that bad boy over to Intruder again. And it's already got the parameter populated. Tack that on. And <laughs> it's already found a couple of different issues here. Um, this is actually not the intended vulnerability, uh, but it did find a, a file that indicates that there's cross domain flash policy there. And as we're going through here, you can see that the site seems to be responding normally. Um, it's getting some 404s here because it's checking for default Apache and Tomcat stuff. That's probably from J2EE scan. Um, and then it's going to check for pretty much everything that I asked it to do. Now, this is great and all. And clearly, you know, we've got a lot of results here. This is, you know, certainly a pretty <laughs> you know, ideal scenario to be in as a penetration tester. Now, what you're going to run into sometimes, though, and this is going to kind of segue into my session handling uh, section here. And the session handling is so important because a web application session, when you log in, it should either create a cookie in your browser or your local storage. And when a user logs out, that session cookie should be ephemeral to the server, and it should be invalidated on the server side, hopefully. And a new value should be generated upon the next login. It shouldn't use the, the previous session token. Also, hopefully, random and undeterminable. So if you have a very large website, which I've ran into this multiple times, where you know, you've got thousands and thousands of parameters to scan, and it's a slow website, you know it's going to take probably a few days for their scanner to get through it because you've got to throttle it back. You're going to run into an issue where idle timeout, and I know, I'm sure all of us know what an idle timeout on a website is. It's when you've been inactive for too long, like five minutes, you're automatically logged out. Now, this is going to cause a problem. Because attempting to scan authenticated content from an unauthenticated context is essentially useless. And in the words of my boss and director, Jake Reynolds, during automated scanning phases, it is easy for a tester to think they are testing authenticated functionality, but in fact, their session got logged out three hours ago. That's like testing a cinder block wall for weaknesses with your forehead and kneecaps, and you shouldn't pay someone to do that. So if you're ever receiving an application pen test, make sure you ask for an explanation as to how the tester is going to ensure that their session is valid during authenticated automated testing. And this is non-trivial to, um, or actually this is trivial rather, to basically exploit and burp. And when I say exploit, I guess, you know, essentially take care of. So right now, what we can do here is if we go, we've got our login.php here, and we can see where we post right here. And this is kind of an RL login. login. Okay. Now, I think one of these randoms. Yeah, I'll find one. one. So we know, we know that, that this is 
logged in and I know that it has content, we can go ahead and render it and actually act up to verify, okay, I'm logged in on this particular request. If hey. I hey Logan. Yeah. You're breaking up again, man. Okay. Hold on, hold on one second. Maybe can you hear me? maybe the bits in the line need to catch up with you. Maybe you're just going too fast. <laughs> Yeah, if I get out in the weeds too much, uh, feel free to stop me, ask questions if there's anything that um, that you're curious about or um, I may have not uh, explained, um, I guess, uh, you know, what's the word for it, uh, appropriately, so to speak, or if I haven't explained it in enough detail, um, feel free to stop here. Is my, is my mic quality coming in through better? Yeah, it's working now. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, not sure why that's happening. But anywho, moving on. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we go any further? Okay. Not yet. Okay, cool. So um, we render this page and we can see that, you know, it, this is logged in, right? We can see um, if we log out here it should look like this. Now, if we take this into repeater and we delete this value right here, what we should get is, looks like we're gonna get a 503 response. It's gonna look like this. So if I was logged out, I would see nothing but 503s populating here. And that's not going to make, you know, make it possible for you to get to the actual juicy content that you need. So what you can do is to automatically fix this for you um, is you can go into the project options and we can use something called the cookie jar and session handling rules. And session handling rules can automatically handle your session as the name implies. The cookie jar basically stores all of the cookies that are generated and issued by websites, and they automatically include it into requests within your, you know, your request to your site. And you can basically scope that cookie jar to apply to any of your specific tools, including the scanner, extender plugins, which will be invoked when you do the scanner, um, intruder, sequencer, repeater. You won't find often that this is necessary, but you can, if you do, you can set it up like that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new rule and we're gonna call this session rule one, right? And we're gonna attach that to the extender and our scope here. And we're going to add a rule action and we're going to check if a session is valid. And what we're going to do to do that is we're just going to issue the current request. And we can, we, we can know what a logged out request looks like because in the response body, we're going to have, in fact, let me just go double check it. Uh, yes, real quick. So in the response body, there's going to be 503 service temporarily unavailable, or we could use the word service unavailable. Uh, any sort of unique string to the actual logout or logged out state uh, is going to be helpful. So we can take something like that. We'll use the, uh, the service unavailable one. So we're going to look for the literal string service unavailable. And when we do that, we're gonna essentially, if the session isn't valid, we're gonna run a macro. And that macro is gonna be that request that we use to log in. That's got our username and our password and that actually generates the cookie here. And I can test this macro real quick to ensure that it's working by issuing the request and seeing that it's got a 302 found. And let's see here. Yes, real quick. 
back. So let's here. Let's just double check this here. Didn't do any of this beforehand because I wanted you guys to kind of be able to follow along as I do this. So let's see. Okay, uh, I see what's happened. Um, one of the change password <laughs> requests uh, went to the scanner. Uh, there is a form in here that has a change password field and I hit it with a scanner and it looks like it's changed the password to probably something that I won't be able to determine. So uh, let me just refire that up real quick here. So that, that's another thing with a scanner also, and something that you guys should take note of as well uh, from my mistake right there just now, is that basically you should be careful about what you scan as well with the active scanner, um, because you can break stuff if it's a, you know, a function that changes something, like for example, a change password field, uh, that's obviously not good to hit with the scanner because then it's going to end up changing your password to some ridiculously long string that you probably won't be able to figure out what it is. So that's uh, something to consider there. But I went ahead and rebooted. And we'll log back in here and capture this request. Let's do this. Okay, so when we don't have a cookie, we have a set cookie value that occurs in this request. So we can go back to our session handling rule and go to our macro. And we can edit this request. And when we replay it, we should see that see test macro Sorry, just one second. This my browser's got a a cookie in it already that's messing this up. I think it might generate one on Okay. So does it change? Okay. So this is probably a poor example because it doesn't actually use it doesn't actually change the session value when you log in like it's supposed to. Um, that's a security issue in and of itself. But this is invalid. Uh, let's see here. Delete all. And we can just take this once again. Intercept. Forward it through should show up in our history here. Okay, perfect. Go back to this, 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 and again, this macro is literally just the login request that's generating uh, the cookie itself. So, uh, we're going to take that instead of that one. 
We're going to come down to our request here. It generates a cookie, and we're going to use that. And do that. And essentially, there's a checkbox down here that says update current request with cookies from session handling cookie jar. And what that's going to do is, so anytime that I submit for a request here that doesn't have a cookie in it, like for example, um, if I take this and I apply it to my proxy rule, uh, my proxy rule, I can go ahead now and what I can do is I can open the session tracer and we can see how our request is being modified. So I'm going to submit this um, without any sort of cookie. And let's see. So, for example, Okay, so maybe it's not a 503 when it fails. It can be a couple of things. So if we take this, take this, and this is just part of building a session handling rule. It can actually get a lot more complicated than this. So I can just throw it back into repeater, hit it, and it's actually a 302 found in the location is dot dot slash dot dot slash login dot php so that's actually what we want to use i think that 503 session or service unavailable is not uh um not a very good thing to look at here so we'll use that instead and what we'll do is is instead of this we'll open our session tracer back up should see something in it. We come back to here. Let's go. Yeah. We can take our cookies out. Hmm. Wonder why this isn't working. Well, that's always the that's always what happens <laughs> when you try to do a live demo. I know. Well, this can get uh, pretty down in the weeds as well, um, as far as just technical stuff and um, you know some of the things that can cause it to happen. See, the problem is, is this app doesn't have proper sessions to begin with. I didn't realize that when I was demoing it for this, but um, the concept is is that. Basically, you can take the login request, and when you submit that login request, it should set a cookie in the response. And the cookie jar will automatically take that cookie, and it'll insert it into your scanner request. So you don't even need to log in again after you've set that up. You can just literally let it run, basically. And any time it gets logged out, it'll just re-log back in for you. So not sure why that doesn't want to do that. I think it has to do with the, the session value staying in the browser and not changing um but as far as that goes yeah um these can get pretty down in the weeds like i said and it can get pretty um intense especially when you're not dealing with cookie based authentication sometimes websites will use like bearer tokens or java web tokens or json web tokens and those are passed as an http header and a lot of times you need a custom extension that can handle it like i have a couple things in here like bearer authorization token uh json web tokens etc uh that are for that specific scenario but uh the moral of the story here is that essentially burp what it can do is it can handle all your sessions for you. There's no need to manually move your mouse around, click around, stay logged in. And that way you can step away from babysitting your automated scanning and you can go tackle those more manual 
um, issues that require human attention to them. So, yeah, sorry that didn't uh, <laughs> exactly uh, play uh, out uh, in a way that was like super demonstrable. Um, the concept there is essentially, though, as demonstrated, though, you create a rule that looks for a specific response from a site when you're logged out and it detects that you're logged out and brings you back in. So uh, I think our last thing here is going to be collaborator out of band testing. And we kind of showed a bit of that off, but this is pretty quick to go over and shouldn't only take but a couple minutes to cover. So Burp Pro comes with something called Burp Collaborator. And what Burp Collaborator does is that it can generate a completely unique URL that you can use to do testing with. And this is a random string of alphanumeric characters and it's unique every time. And you can see, you can pull it when you have situations where you're performing server-side request forgery or you're somehow able to make a web server forward a request or make a request on its own behalf to another service, you can use Burp Collaborator to essentially check for, okay, this is a URL that no one else would ever feasibly visit. It's completely randomized and it's specific for this one test. That way you have fully conclusive proof that if you see communication in here coming back, you can check the IP address that it came from, what time, and the type of request. And you can see where it actually has my browser user agent and everything in there that hit it. And when I scanned this little parameter on a demo site or the vulnerable website, this uh, particular one right here, this is ssrfdns.php. You see Burp quickly found that there was an external service interaction because it submitted this host, it submitted this burp collaborator, and the collaborator server received a DNS lookup from that IP address, meaning that you just made that server make a DNS request on your behalf, even though it shouldn't have been able to. And the reason why that's conclusive proof is because, again, completely randomized URL and there's no feasible way anyone could ever hit it other than <laughs> other than what you've told it to. So Collaborator is really good. Um, you can also set up your own custom Collaborator server. Uh, we have one at depth because we found that for some reason, some places will block the burpcollaborator.net domain. Um, usually, I don't really see how that could ever, in theory, prevent like an exploit from happening because a real attacker is just going to use their own server that's not Burp Collaborator. But um, the Collaborator client in and of itself allows you to spin up random subdomains that allow you to monitor for service interaction. And we can see here if we take this request and fire up our old Collaborator again, we can copy to clipboard. And we can throw this in here. And we will get a look up. So pretty sweet. Uh, a lot of times this is really common in server-side request forgery and formula injection, like sites that dynamically generate like Excel spreadsheets or CSVs from user input. A lot of times you can basically make them execute formulas if you just inject formulas into the input. And a lot of times you can tell whether or not the server is actually rendering those formulas by making it do like a DNS lookup to like Burp Collaborator. And that way, you know, if you get a lookup, it just parsed a function that you put in as an Excel formula <laughs> and executed as code, which can of course lead to other bad things such as, you know, full compromise of the server. So Burp uh, Collaborator is definitely a super invaluable tool to have. And it's one of the 
main selling points of Pro, in my humble opinion here. So, uh, proxy rules as well is one more thing. I'm going to go over this one, take a second, it's pretty easy to explain. So, proxy rules, anything that's going through your web browser is considered proxied. Um, and under the proxy rules, you can make it do specific things like add or strip headers out of a request. Uh, you can automatically change your user agent, require non-cached responses, ignore cookies, um, spoof the core's origin, disable the browser XSS protection if you're debugging a cross-site scripting issue and you think it's the browser protection stopping it, you can strip that response header from the server and you can basically test you know locally on your machine for certain situ you know situations um which is really cool you could disable javascript remove certain tags convert links from https to clear text http doesn't seem like it'd be that useful although you'd be really surprised there's a lot of sites that are just not built correctly out there that have all sorts of various jank to them <laughs> for lack of a better word. And uh, some of these tools can make those sites actually usable and scannable. And uh, not often in modern sites do you need to do this, but you can run into it. And there's various other configurations in here that you can do that are really kind of specific to certain edge cases. But um, again, just kind of to demonstrate the power, you can also create, um, any of your own rules as well and uh, you can modify anything from the request headers the bodies to a parameter name to match certain conditions and you know strip things out add things in as needed very useful and uh, very powerful in specific situations so um and that's basically any of these rules. As I'm browsing, I don't need to interact with Burp. It's automatically modifying my browser traffic in such a way that I don't need to interact with it anymore. It's going to do all the work for me. So, yeah, um, as far as that goes, um, that kind of covers the collaborator out of band testing, uh, proxy rules, session handling, active scan. Passive modules, um, Burp application store, and I think that's really all the time that uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to cover this. We could definitely go on for hours and hours um, about some of the other capabilities, such as proxying Python scripts and exploits through Burp Suite for when out of the box exploit code doesn't work as intended or it's not working properly, yeah, you can proxy it right through Burp and modify it without needing to go nitty gritty into the actual code of the exploit to determine why the request isn't working because you can interact with it right in Burp in a graphical interface. Very strong, um, has saved my bacon in quite a few cases where something seemed like it just wasn't gonna work and then I managed to fix it using Burp. So very, very, very powerful tools. Um, Burp Pro, I would say bottom line, if you're serious about web application penetration testing, the automated scanner and the passive modules are gonna be able to get you pretty far, um, just right out of the box with some extensions installed. Um, it's not like a, you know, a, a golden gun by any means for finding every single exploit out there. Uh, there's a lot of times where the active scans just there's certain things it's just not going to be able to find because of uh, an exploit that may require going through four or five different requests, you know, to get to a point where it's exploitable, like setup, etc. But it's going to find all that low hanging fruit, and quite frankly, I'll tell you from experience that that low hanging fruit is still everywhere out there, and if there were more people testing their apps with burp scanner then you know the web application security world would be in a lot better place than it is right now so um basically before i uh wrap this up i just want to kind of give a a plug here for depth security um we find flaws that other firms miss critical flaws often 
We do zero day vulnerability research. We don't outsource our work. We have conservative and contextual severity ratings. We don't write anything a critical that we didn't exploit with a detailed attack chain with exploitation. No, it's not going to be a you know screenshot of Nessus output. Uh, quality over quantity, and if there's a way in, we'll find it. And some of the services we provide are here. And uh, won't bore you with that for too long. But you guys have any questions for me or things that? You'd like me to go back over, or I don't know if my voice kind of cut out <laughs> where in specific parts or not. But yeah, so um, I've uh, so right now the the chat window doesn't have anything, and I've uh, allowed people to unmute themselves. So either free to grab the chat window, or if you want to just unmute and ask a question directly, that's fine. The, uh, the I've got a couple of questions right out of the out of the gate. Java RMI issues and Adobe Common libraries, uh, would this be able to help with those particular issues? So the like a, like Apache Common collections, the Java yeah. RMI stuff, yeah. um, this does have YSO serial integration um, in it, and it can do that. Um, it depends on the way it's set up because sometimes you have like JMX connector through like Apache AGP, AJP that you can exploit it through. Um, Sometimes you can do that. Uh, basically, though, with the RMI protocol, it's more of like a binary protocol, and Burp is really good at handling like HTTP. You can make it submit like serialized objects into the RMI registry, but a lot of times people just use the LISO serial command line tool because they can just hit it right out. Right out. You know, you may have a as a present concept that code executed, but you know, you know, didn't want to go any further for whatever reason. But to answer your question, yes and no. Um, it depends on how it's configured and set up. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Did you did you have another one, Rob? Nope, that was it. That was just the uh, the Java RMI and the Adobe Common Collections. So, um, well, Logan, I appreciate you being with us tonight. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to make it back up to Roanoke before too long. I'll turn my camera back on. So. Um, if yes, yeah. uh, if nobody else has any other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and close it down for this evening.